This is Nick Black and today I'm in West Hollywood and I'm talking to, shall we call him, the cosmopolitan Philippe Moray. Philippe, thank you very much for taking time to talk to us. First of all, Philippe, I want to ask you a bit about your background. Now, you were born in Paris and you came to Melbourne when you were just a, a little baby. Now, tell us a bit about your parents' movements just prior to your birth. Missionary, I think. <laughs> uh, my parents immigrated to Melbourne in 1951. My father met my mother in Paris. My mother was studying mime at the Jean-Louis Barrow School of Mime. They decided to go to Australia. Now tell us about your godfather. Well, my godfather is a legend, Marcel Marceau. He actually knew my mother and my father before they met each other in Paris. I remember as a kid at Aspendale seeing Marceau come to visit us at the beach and it was always a big thrill. I remember he used to put olive oil, the olive oil that was left in the wooden salad bowl and everyone had eaten the salad the olive oil left and he'd rub it on his stomach which we always thought was very peculiar strange thing to do with the olive oil did he say anything to you Philippe? he's very talkative in real life Marcel you come from a very artistic background your mum and your dad how did you get interested in film? well I did grow up in a very artistic environment my father was one of the founders of the Museum of Modern Art in Australia and so I grew up with the children of my parents friends and they were people like Charles Blackman and Arthur Boyd Albert Tucker it really was, uh, particularly for Melbourne at that time, a very bohemian kind of a situation. My parents lived at number nine Collins Street, right at the top of Collins Street. So I lived near all the movie theatres. Whenever I came home from school, I would see a lot of movies as a kid growing up in the city. It was kind of easy for me. They had what was then called hour shows, newsreels, which would be a compilation of cartoons, Three Stooges, newsreels I used to see though they change them once a week so I used to see a lot of those so I just loved movies first I wanted to be an actor and then I got an 8mm camera from my dad and shot my first film in Fitzroy Gardens on the beaches at Asmodale and just kind of drifted into it and when I found out that you could actually get paid to make movies much later on I thought this is something I should be doing what did your mum and dad think about it they really encouraged me I was painting a lot too I mean I first earned a living as a painter I had an exhibition in Melbourne before I left Melbourne at the Argus Gallery around 1967 and then I had about 10 exhibitions in London, Sydney and Melbourne. When I got to London in 67 after I left La Trobe University I worked for Oz magazine doing cartoons. I did some illustrations for the Beatles in the illustrated lyrics. So I was really in the visual world and it was not much of a jump to get into movies. Tell us a bit about your little home movies. They were basically imitations of films that I'd just seen. So we did our own version of Ben-Hur in Little Collins Street with bicycles. We did an hysterical version of Eight and a Half on the beach at Asmodale, which shocked everyone because we put up a big wooden cross. And I think I tried to crucify my then girlfriend. The people called the police. They said the kids were crucifying someone on the beach. They were my imitation of films I'd seen and liked. And was she still your girlfriend after? No. I assume roughly around the same time you started up a little magazine called Cinema Papers which is still going to this day. Tell us how that came about. Well, when I went to La Trobe University in 67, I started the Film Society there and I was a big fan of the French magazine, Cahiers de Cinema, which was promoter of the French New Wave. So I started this magazine. It was literally Cinema Papers was the translation into English of Cahiers de Cinema. We used the Gestetner or the Ronia, whatever it was called in those days, at La Trobe University and October 1967 was the first issue. Right. Now, there's a little piece that is quite interesting that you're going to read out for us, just looking it up right now. Yeah, I thought this was quite amusing, just rummaging through my archive here. I looked at the first issue, and there's something called Notes of the Manifesto, October 1967, and I'll just read it quickly. It says, We are thinking about cinema here in Melbourne, Australia. We are involved in cinema, but we are working and thinking in a complete vacuum. Our tiny non-budget films are shots in the dark. Our tiny Tiny efforts at thoughts on film are feeble because we are too busy saving our lives and our souls from mediocrity. There is not one champion of the cinema in Australia who has any courage or intelligence whatsoever. There is not one man here in whom we can put our faith. Local production, uninspired, barely existent, pathetic. The Commonwealth Film Unit does not rate, nor do pseudo underground films. Local television production pampers the idiotic mind. Let us hope, a hopeless hope, it is not indicative of the state of the Australian consciousness. You can't see around corners is devoid of wit, intelligence, form, humanism, meaning and sensitivity. Homicide 
side is not worth a blink. Hunter is an hour-long ad for toilet paper. The maxim that one cannot get money is an excuse for mediocre and unintelligent efforts. And it goes on like that. I guess we were angry young men then, but how things have changed. Did that send you off to England? Yeah, that sent me off to England. I mean, in those days, actually, well, there was certainly no film schools. There was basically nothing. And it was kind of a thing in those days. You just went to London, just one of those things one did. Even for musical bands, too? Yeah, for musical bands. And it was a rough environment in Australia, even in the 60s, for creative people. And my father encouraged, he knew I loved movies, and he knew at that point there was not much chance for me to get experience in Australia, so he encouraged me to go. I just want to get on to you at first. Trouble in Melopolis. Tell us a bit about that. Trouble in Melopolis was my first feature film, and every Australian I knew in London at the time, Martin Sharp, a painter, Richard Neville, the editor of Oz, Jermaine Greer, who was then an actress, Tom Cowan was the DP, John Wiley was the production manager. We all got together and we made this musical, 35 mil musical, send-up of Hollywood movies of the 30s. And you were in it too? I'm in it too, yeah. yeah. Did it get released? It had a premiere at a theatre called the Paris Pullman in Chelsea. It had midnight runs. It's a funny movie, funny movie. Is it accessible? Well, it's going to be. I just found a negative and I'm going to get it on video. Certainly, I think it would be interesting. I want to jump on to Swastika, which featured the first colour film of Hitler shot by his mistress, Ava Braun. Now, tell us how you found that footage there, Philippe. Well, briefly, the background to that is I had written a script called The Phantom vs. The Fourth Reich, based on the comic strip character. Like all kids then, I was a Phantom fan. Somehow, the script found its way to Peter Sellers, who loved it. He wanted to play Hitler at the age of 80, and he wanted to play Hitler's son, Heinrich Hitler, and he wanted to play The Phantom. Unfortunately, the film never got made. I think the people who owned The Phantom didn't want to make a comedy. But in the course of that, I'd researched a lot about Nazis, and uh, I went to a producer, Sandy Lieberson, and his partner, David Putnam. They encouraged me to make a documentary. I wrote one called The Double-Headed Eagle, which was about the early days of the Nazi party, and I wrote and directed Swastika, which was 1933 to 1939, the Nazification of Germany. And I spent a year researching it. I had a wonderful researcher called Lutz Becker, my partner and co-writer on it. We located Eva Braun's home movies in the Pentagon, 16mm for Color. We had seen a photo of Eva Braun with a 16mm camera and I had wondered where the hell is that film. When we called the Pentagon they said that they needed to date everything that the Pentagon can. We found out that the US Marine Signal Corps had been the first into Hitler's house at Ever Salzburg. So we called the Pentagon they said that everything they captured in Germany was indexed under date of capture, not content. So we went back into the newspapers found out when the Marine Signal Corps went in. Called the Pentagon back and I mean I fell over when they called you know, about three months later and said we have found eight cans of 16 millimeter color film captured in Eva Braun's bedroom. So that was a sensation at the time. Now that film is used in every documentary on the Nazis. But when Swastika came out, it caused a big stir. Yeah, because you guys were the first ones to basically get that film out into the light, so to speak. I want to go on to Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? That was a very successful documentary. It sort of established your reputation. Would I be correct in saying that? Uh, it did. Well, Swastika caused a big stir. It yeah. was the official UK picture at Cannes in 73 or something. So I I was off to a good start. And then Brother Can You Spare a Dime, I conceived of it as the flip side of what was happening in the democracies when what was happening in Nazi Germany was occurring in swastika. It's exactly the same time period. So they're kind of two sides of the same coin. And I really wanted to make feature films, so both of those documentaries really were conceived as narrative feature films. No narration, which at the time was quite original. Even now, most documentaries have narration, but I felt that the audience would get more if they weren't being lectured. I mean, I find that even today, I find that documentaries pretty dull when they're lecturing to you. So this was more of a visceral experience. Both of these films were designed to be an experience of the time as opposed to so-called educational, but more of an emotional impact. Thankfully, it worked. With Brother Can You Spare a Dime in particular, it got a theatrical release in the United States, which was unbelievable at the time for a documentary. It's so hard to get releases for documentaries. And that got me off to a running start. And then I went back to Australia to do Mad Dog Morgan and that would have been late 75. And how did you come to Mad Dog Morgan? Did you know of the character in Australian folklore? Well I knew all the bush rangers. I actually liked that movie Robbery Under Arms which I'd seen when I was a kid with Peter Finch. Margaret Carnegie had written a historical book on Mad Dog Morgan and she sent it to me in London and I thought that there was a movie in it. That was 75 when unbeknownst to me Fred Skepsi, Peter Weir and I think Donald Crombie were all starting up films too. That And the next year it came and in 76, four films just out of the blue came out of Australia, which was just amazing. Mad Dog, Picnic and Hanging Rock, Devil's Playground, and Caddy, and basically the world movie community.
community went, what's going on here? It was interesting because really those four films happened, they were all separate from each other, one of those spontaneous combustion cultural events. I want to ask you how you came to cast an American, Dennis Hopper, in the lead of Mad Dog Morgan, and did that create a bit of a stir at the time? Well, it always amuses me, because I have been asked that before, but it's very amusing to me for a couple of reasons. Firstly, there were no Australians in 1850 when the film was set. Everyone was either English, Irish, American, Chinese. The only Australians were the Aboriginals, who, by the way, David Gulpil plays an Aboriginal in Mad Dog Morgan. Historically, in terms of historical accuracy, it's kind of amusing to me that anyone would say, why didn't you use an Australian to play an Australian? Well, they didn't exist at that time. But Dennis Hopper, he was on a list of three or four people we wanted. I think Timothy Dalton we asked, Stacey Keach we asked, and we felt we needed a so-called name just to help us get the money to make the movie. I didn't know at the time that Dennis Hopper was blackballed in Hollywood. He'd done Easy Rider and he'd done the last movie and he told Lou Wasserman or the other executives at Universal basically to go F themselves for various reasons. You know, he was wild. He was absolutely a wild man at the time. When we called Hopper's agent from Melbourne and said, is Dennis Hopper available? Well, the guy nearly came through the telephone. His head nearly came through the telephone. Is he available? So we flew to New Mexico where Dennis Hopper was living in D.H. Lawrence's old compound in this little town called Taos. It was a hairy flight going in mountains and we landed and Dennis Hopper was at the end of the runway holding a rifle by a pickup truck full of bullet holes and I thought Jesus Christ this guy is mad dog we spent three days there and it was pretty wild there I mean it literally were shootouts at three o'clock in the morning there it was Indians and shooting it was just incredible this is my first film with a major actor and I didn't really know how stars were supposed to behave so I really took everything at face value and if he was acting a bit strange that was fine anyway he came down to Australia and we shot it and because he was a rebel at that that time and he was wild I just felt it was perfect casting and he did a great Irish accent for that period and it just worked out great and how was he during the shooting did he stay off the booze and the drugs because uh, I think at that time he was having a substance problems as they say here well I mean he'd be the first to say that he was so I'm not telling tales out of school but key to me was what he did when I said action and I feel that way now I don't care what a person does as long as they can deliver whatever it takes and he delivered a wonderful performance for us and he never held up production or anything like that. I mean, the film was shot in six weeks in the bush under difficult circumstances. He was great. He was highly trained. He had been under contract when he was 18 at Warner Brothers, Rebel Without a Cause, Giant, all those movies. He was excellent. After Mad Dog Morgan, there was a, quite a bit of a break, and I think your first US picture, Beast Within, would that be correct? Yeah, after Mad Dog. Well, Mad Dog was totally the opposite of what the government wanted Australian films to be at the time, because the government was funding films, and they were really concerned about issues like tourism and what the image of Australia would be worldwide and here they saw Dennis Hopper being buggered in a jail which they didn't exactly think would attract tourists to Australia at least not the kind they wanted so I found it frankly difficult the film was very controversial because of the violence despite the fact that it was very historically accurate and when I got to the United States the film got uh, fantastic reviews in California for some reason so that encouraged me to stay a while and then United Artists saw the film and asked me whether I would direct the beast within that was my first job basically if I'd been offered a picture in Australia I would have stayed but it was just too controversial and you've been living here ever since is that correct basically I've been here ever since I did go back I love working in Australia of course and I did three other feature films in Australia Captain Invincible was one Return of Captain Invincible I did I think in 1983 something like that and then I did Death of a Soldier in Melbourne which I loved doing because that was an historical story and I could shoot in the streets where I'd grown up it was just a fantastic experience for me doing that film and then as a gag I'd done Howling 2 which had been very successful as a satirical horror movie but I thought it would be hysterical to do a marsupial werewolf film that was the idea of that. How did the Howling films come into your arena? Well The Beast Within had been very successful it's still a big cult horror movie. It was the first horror movie to use what's now uh, ancient history, but those bladder effects, bulging eyelids. The first Howling had been very successful. I was just offered Howling 2, and my agent encouraged me to do it. What particularly fascinated me about it was that we were going to shoot it behind the Iron Curtain in Prague, 
And I thought that would be an adventure. It turned out to be an amazing experience to shoot mm -hmm. behind the Iron Curtain. Prague was basically an occupied city. I had an enormous crew, 180 people. Because it was a communist society, no one could get fired. Everyone had their jobs for life in the studio. It was a situation where, I, obviously, I couldn't speak Czech. I had three interpreters. Again, because it was basically occupied, you couldn't use walkie-talkies. You couldn't use photocopying machines. So it was like making a movie in the First World War. Instead of walkie-talkies, they gave me six guys on bicycles. And we'd be sending messages and it worked. It was a really interesting experience. What was that, Philip? Were they just backward with technology or they were just paranoid about things infecting their communist system? It was basically a security issue. They didn't want people photocopying documents. So, for example, all the scripts were typed on carbon paper. Everything was a carbon copy. I guess there was an element of primitive technology, but the main issue was security. They were concerned about people having walkie-talkies and photocopying machines. There's a strong argument that says that the fax machine was one of the things that brought down the Iron Curtain. I want to get on to Communion now, which was a fairly controversial novel, or not really a novel, according to Whitley Stryber. He says it's all true. How did you come to that? Well, it was certainly novel. I don't know whether it was a novel. I had met Whitley in London in 1966 or 67 before he was a famous writer of horror stories. We'd followed each other's careers over the years. And I met up with him actually in New York in 84, 85, I think, at a screening of, coincidentally, Death of a Soldier. I had lunch with him and then he told me that he didn't know what to do because he thought that he'd been abducted by aliens. I recommended that he get a psychiatrist and a publisher. He did both. And the rest is history. And that was an amazing experience. The book became the number one New York Times bestseller on the non-fiction list. I went to the various studios and I thought it'd be a shoe-in because it was the number one bestseller. And funnily enough, a couple of studios said they didn't want to do it because they didn't believe it was true. Pointed out to them, did they think Raiders of the Lost Ark was true, for example. But anyway, we eventually got it done as a independent movie. I raised the money. Half the budget came from Australia, half from London. My take on the film really was, I always thought it was more of a psychological story than a real story so that's how I made the film in the movie it's quite clear that this guy is either going crazy or it really happened and we never really commit and I think that's probably why the studios were concerned about my approach because the studios like a black and white ending and I was insisting on an ambiguous ending which I think was the right way to go but thankfully the film has had a great life so I made it in 88 89 and it's just gone on and on and on there have been so many derivative shows from communion x-files abduction movies there's been so much and it's a film that I really like. I love Christopher Walken in the film. I think he gave a great performance as a writer. It's tough to play a writer because, and it's tough having a writer as a main character in a movie because writers don't do anything. They sit and think and type, which compared to Lethal Weapon and other movies is not that particularly fascinating. But Christopher Walken, in his face, his acting, you felt there was a lot going on in his face. The burning question is, Philippe, is do you believe in aliens? <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe, without a doubt, that logic would say that there's somewhere there is life in the universe. Whether they... Said hello to Whitley? Whether yeah. they flew halfway across the universe to give Whitley Strieber an anal probe, as he described it in the book, I just don't know that that's what they'd be into if they actually arrived on Earth. But I think it's a fascinating subject, and many people with a lot of integrity really believe that there are aliens here and everything, but I never found any evidence of it. I was at a UFO conference in Washington, D.C. in 88, where there were 4,000 people who were believed they'd been abducted and various stories and a fellow came up to me and he said are you Philippe Moore? I said yes. He said your movie and what you're doing is a complete fraud and a sham and it's just shocking and I said well you don't know me how can you possibly say a thing like that and he said well the aliens told me so there's a lot of absurdity involved with this subject matter but it's fascinating Have you seen South Park? Absolutely there's a lot of there's communion references in that with the abduction and uh, the And the anal probe of Carmen. <laughs> Unfortunately I'm stuck with the anal probe as one of the things in my filmography. <laughs> You've been very busy since communion. You've done Art Deco Detective and a Pterodactyl Woman from Beverly Hills. And I just want to quickly mention Precious Fine with Rutger Hauer and Joan Chen. Richard III, tell us a little bit about Richard III. Richard III, that was a very interesting thing. That was a movie that we did for the internet. We actually got it on the net, but in 96, I mean, you needed to be NASA to download Richard III. But it was an experiment. Burning Down the House. Burning Down the House is completed. It's 
stars John Savage as a down and out film director in Hollywood who's talked into burning down his house by his agent to get the insurance money to make a movie. It's a funny movie. An interesting title is Snide and Prejudice. Snide and Prejudice is a movie I've always wanted to make in terms of its content. It's a story about the rise of Hitler and you know ever since I did Swastika I wanted to do a live action version in some form and so the device I came up with in this movie, I wrote this particular movie, was that there's a character in a mental asylum in Los Angeles who believes he's Hitler. There's a crazy psychiatrist who believes that the treatment for this is to reenact historical scenes of Hitler's rise. So I was able to do a movie about the rise of Hitler in an unusual context. And also Thick and Thin and Joseph Gift. Thick and Thin was a bit of a laugh. I shot it in Mexico with Robert Townsend. Actually, again, the shooting experience was wonderful. I ended up using Sam Peckinpah and John Huston's Mexican crew shooting in the jungles of Mexico behind Puerto Vallarta. Robert Townsend was in Hollywood Shuffle, wonderful actor. That film, I think maybe Buena Vista are going to release, and it's going to be on cable here on HBO. Joseph's Gift, to me personally, is a more interesting movie. It's kind of experimental. It's the biblical story of Joseph told in modern day. It's set in downtown LA in the Garment District, but it's very close to the biblical story. And I notice your godfather's in it. He makes an appearance. Does he say anything? He doesn't. No. <laughs> All right, Philippe. Well, we better leave it there, and thanks for taking time to talk to us. Thanks very much, Philippe Mora. Thank you very much.